The fair holidays in Glasgow begin this week. Nearly all the shipyards, engineering establishments and other works will close and work will not be resumed until Monday, July the 27th. Mrs. Pretty Frocks for Coast and Country. Still a few bathing costumes to clear out. Cotton and lie. Keen demand and universal praise for the lightweight Crampton Ford cars. 42 Sucky Hall Street. A yeah. holiday spent among the scenic beauty of the Clyde Estuary is a source of delight from first society entertainers in Kelvin Grove Park, Scots Guards in Queen's Park. The German Burgomaster have been in Glasgow this week. The Lord Provost expressed delight at having them as guests and was delighted they could show them the building of battleships. The Archduke Francis Ferdinand, heir to the throne of Austria-Hungary, and his wife, the Duchess of Hohenberg, were assassinated yesterday in the streets of Sarajevo. Two revolver shots were fired in the... I remember reading at the time with a slight feeling of superiority that we as a nation were not given to this sort of thing. At the beginning of July 1914, the 1st Battalion, the Cameroonians, was carrying out battalion training at Blair, Athol and Jershire. We were all very fit. We had spent a strenuous time on battalion exercises. Now and again we used to go to the Athol Arms and replace the moisture we had lost with Mr. Tennant's excellent beer. The Lord Provost and the Corporation of the City of Glasgow request the honour of your company at the presentation of the freedom of the city to the Right Honourable Sir Edward Grey, Secretary of State for Foreign Affairs, on Tuesday 4th August at 12 o'clock. I fear there is no chance of my being able to leave London and come to Glasgow on Tuesday, but I'm sure you will understand that under the present circumstances I have no choice in the matter. We cursed our government for its procrastination. Everything we read made it quite clear that there would be a war and that the Germans would invade Belgium. The lamps are going out all over Europe. We shall not see them lit again in our lifetime. By midnight, on the 4th, we were at war. The reception of the news in Glasgow was of a milder nature than one would expect. Owing to the lateness of the hour, there were not a great many people in the streets. Those who had remained received the intimation quietly. Lord Kitchener appeals for 100,000 men to join the army within the next 10 days the other 400,000 to follow as quickly as possible. This message is addressed to the young men of our native country between the ages of 19 and 30. Now is the day and now the hour. Tomorrow may be too late. I received a wire containing the single word, mobilize. Next day, I changed into uniform and said a cheerful goodbye at the office. The city of Glasgow proved itself second to none in its answer to the call. The town council recruited two fine battalions. The first Glasgow, which was mainly drawn from the tramway employees of the city, and the second Glasgow, which was recruited from former members of the Boys' Brigade. At a meeting of the Chamber of Commerce directors, it was unanimously resolved to form a Glasgow Chamber of Commerce Battalion. Recruiting began for the 15th Battalion, the Highland Light Infantry. The building rang with bustle and laughter. Well, who has enough change and shillings for all this lot that we passed <laughs> The men were clean and muscular, and how they grinned. Some were garishly tattooed with ships, dragons, pierced hearts and sweethearts initials. In order to pass into the army, some consented to have half a mouthful of imperfect teeth extracted. They were no laggards in war. Every mother's son proudly held a gun and sang God save our king. Glasgow had the war and the horrors of war brought very near yesterday. About 1,000 Belgians were received into the city. All bore signs of trying experiences. Their faces were eloquent of grief. The little ones made a strong appeal to the Glasgow heart. They were bright and merry as they waved gaily to the crowds. Breakfast was prepared in the city hall. Donations of fruit had been given by merchants from the city market. Those for whom private homes were not found were accommodated in various institutions in the city. We marched nearly a thousand strong, 
As we turned into Maryhill Road, the pipe band played which brought the citizens of Maryhill to their windows and the pavements. That night, we marched silently out of a back gate. Only the tramping of marching feet marked our passage. After partaking of a cup of coffee and a cold pie, we lined up and moved off via Salt Market, Argyle Street, Glassford Street to Queen Street Station. Not a cheer was raised, not a band played, hardly a soul to be seen. It was 6am. We got into the train and away we went. We travelled all next day and embarked on the SS Caledonia. A few hours later, we entered the harbour of the Havre. There was a great crowd at the quay, shouting greetings to us. We're not going to land tonight. We'll probably land tomorrow. Cheerio, the new. Company commanders had been summoned and told to move to Mons. The realisation that we would be in the midst of the opening battle of the war seemed to exhilarate all ranks. The battle was extending along the canal, and at any moment we could expect to be engaged. About one hour before dawn, orders came to move at once, as a large force of Germans was reported on the north side of the canal, and the battalion was quite unsupported. Now we marched, day and night, in the hottest August and September France had known for many a year. We halted in a large orchard. Men had teas and washed, took off boots and rested their feet which were now in very poor condition. About four in the afternoon, orders were given that the battalion was to entrench itself. The work was most fatiguing. We had every expectation of being heavily attacked and gone. Everybody was dog tired, having been on the go all the previous night and on the move from 5 a.m. Although we had not been engaged, war was now being brought home to us. On Christmas Eve, we could hear the Germans celebrating Christmas by singing and merrymaking. For roughly 24 hours, they ceased firing at us, and we reciprocated. An attempt at fraternization took place on Christmas Day, Jerry leaving his trench unarmed. Certain souvenirs were exchanged, and if it had been left to the soldiery on both sides, the war would there and then be declared their draw. But towards late afternoon, a stray shot from our right hit one of ours, Corporal Smith. This broke the spell, and the war was resumed. This truce drew forth an army routine order, reminding us that we were in France to fight and not to fraternize with the enemy. We welcomed the new year rather silently. The women of the Scottish Women's Hospital went forth one by one to war fronts in France, Belgium, Serbia, Corsica and Russia. The authorities did not wish the state of Serbia from typhus to be generally known. For three months the epidemic raged. The Scottish women turned up their sleeves and went straight to typhus and typhoid stricken patients. Not one of them asked to come away. I agree to accept the terms of engagement and to accept the rate of £25 per annum. I wish my salary to be paid to myself, Olive Smith, at Salonica. It is a sad duty which I have to perform to see the last adieu to a generous friend of our people. She came to soften the hard fate of a small and most unhappy people, stricken by God and by men, and she shared it unto the last. The officers stared at their watches, and almost before the correct second arrived, the second Scottish rifle started to surge up out of the trenches. Ferrells was fussed out, his monocle in his eye, his sword on his hand. Almost at the same moment came the whip and crack of the enemy machine guns. Only a minute elapsed before the leading men reached the wire. But in that time, terrible execution was done to A Company. I saw Captain Ferris in the first German trench after he'd been badly wounded three times. He was smiling and encouraging everyone that went by him. I personally heard him shout, Go on, B Company! I'm damned proud of you! All the officers of the company were either killed or wounded, and only two sergeants were left. And I think that we owe it to Captain Ferris's example that the company did so well that day.
We landed at the Dardanelles about 12.30pm and got straight into the danger zone. We were ordered to dig and dig for our lives. We had one pick and one shovel among five men. It dawn came before we were four foot down, and with it came enemy shells like mad. I smoked as often as I got a chance to keep away the flies that were a terrible pest. If you had a piece of bread and jam, it was black before it reached your mouth. You had to blow before every bite unless you wanted to swallow them. Great difficulty is experienced in bringing up food and water. Very often our soldiers have to sink little wells in the trench to obtain water, which is pretty much in the nature of soup. I was suffering great pain. The doctor told me I had jaundice. I was fortunate to get on a hospital ship, but I got no food except milk, as I had dysentery also. The inadequacy of the artillery available to support any British attack in Gallipoli was notorious, and ammunition had to be sparingly used for days, even weeks. The turning out of munitions of war not really means success, but it means the saving of lives. The increase in output is so essential to us. Under arrangements with the Ministry of Munitions, Special courses without fee have been organized by the Royal Technical College Glasgow for the preliminary training of unskilled women prepared to offer their full-time services to munition manufacturers. The question of registering women for employment is not limited by the demands of Lord Kitchener. There is shortage of labor in many departments. We may take our own tramway service as an example of shortage. The woman that can drive her own motor car could no doubt look after one belonging to the corporation. Dear Jamie, I'm still sticking at my work. I'll be an engineer before long. There are 25 more women coming in on Monday. We were told the amount of work we do in three weeks would have taken the men three years. And Jamie, the men are quite mad at us. A safeguard against the permanent lowering of wages by the admission of women would be made by asking employers to keep the men's places open for them on their return. The proportion of wages which most munition workers are asked to pay in extra rent cannot, on average, be called excessive. In the case of other workers, a 10% increase appears to be a matter of the greatest anxiety for them. Considerable excitement prevailed in Glasgow Small Debt Court yesterday. Petitions for the ejectment of householders who refused to pay increases of rent were down for hearing. In connection with the sitting of the court, a rent strikers demonstration was held outside the county buildings. The demonstration was one of the results of the campaign against increased rents, which had been conducted during the past few months by Glasgow Women's Housing Association. The proceedings took an unusual course. Sheriff Lee, the presiding judge, strongly urged the petitioner the advisability on patriotic grounds of dropping their actions pending the legislation resulting from the Commission's report inquiring into the rent question. When the results in the courtroom became known, there was much cheering. Tonight, Sunday 25th of April, I will address an anti-war meeting in Pollock Shaws. This is perhaps the first one in Scotland definitely advertised as anti-war. I have done everything that I have done during these last years on principles which are greater and more fundamental than those which have brought the panic legislation which has landed me here. For the full period of my active life, I have been a teacher of economics to the working classes. I wish no harm to any human being. I am a socialist and have been fighting and will fight for an absolute reconstruction of society for the benefit of all. Lusitania was torpedoed and sunk yesterday afternoon by a German submarine about eight miles off the south coast of Ireland. It is feared there has been a heavy loss of life.
At last, we were getting an opportunity to show what stuff is in the sturdy lowland Scott. The order came to let go the gas. Immediately we pulled our smoke helmets over our heads, buttoning the ends under our tunic. Then, my god, it happened. Some of the gas was coming back into our own trench. The smoke wafted round until the place was covered. The wind wasn't strong enough to carry it over. We felt ourselves suffocating under our helmets. Into the traverse a man rushed with the order to stop the gas. The attacking party had been gassed. The patrol had been shot down. The whole thing had turned into a fiasco. In the morning, it was a fearful scene. Crowds of dead lying about in all sorts of positions, with rifles in their hands and packs of equipment on. It was pitiful and ghastly. The Military Service Act 1916 applies to unmarried men, 18 years of age or older, and who will not be 41 years of age on March 2nd, 1916. Men who may be exempted by local tribunals. Men who conscientiously object to competent service. Men who are useful to the We were asked for our opinion, and of course favoured conscription. Why should we suffer hell here, while others at home of military age only read about it? If the country is cold, wait for them. If the country is right, to take them. What are you folks at home going to do for us fellas out here? It's the man who is mean or broke whom we want you to do something for. Dear Lord Provost, I have been waiting to send you my donation to the hospital of Linda Sailors and Soldiers, which you have all so kindly wished to name after me. I heard from Sir William McEwen of the very handsome donation to the hospital of 300 acres of ground round Erskine House. It is delightful to see how kindly the Scottish public are taking up this movement. Yours sincerely, Louise. We were told that it would be impossible for us in Scotland to get artificial limbs. Having unbounded confidence in Glasgow, I had no hesitancy in saying, we have men here who have made the dreadnoughts possible. Men who have clear brains, used to invent all sorts of appliances. The moving spirit of the scheme is Sir William McCune. The limbs will be made in Scotland. Messrs Yarrow of Scotsdon will lead the way in constructing them. By far the greatest naval engagement of the war is that which has taken place off the coast of Jutland on May 31st. Sir David Beatty and his officers fought the entire German high seas fleet until Sir John Jellicoe arrived with his overwhelming fleets and the Germans, fully recognising their weakness, drew off to the shelter of the coast. At a great price in fine ships and gallant men we have gained this, but the price has been willingly paid. <laughs> <laughs> I got a very handy parcel today. Cocoa, condensed milk and sugar. A piano has been brought into our room and we have plenty of fellows who play, so we have some fine sing songs. Some brigades have a cinema where they show Charlie Chaplin, Fatty Arbuckle and Pearl White. Mary had a little skirt. Twas up to date, no doubt. But every time she got inside, she was nearly halfway out. <laughs> Always hearing of one man and another being killed now. Our battalion football team played the Grenadier Guards in the Divisional Cup and won 1-0, which was very satisfactory to the whole battalion. Advance commenced at 7 30 a.m. The enemy opened heavy machine gun and rifle fire as soon as our men jumped over the parapet. Our platoons advanced in waves and we were simply mowed down. Our battalion had been badly hit. B Company had been caught in the wire 
and cut to pieces by machine gun fire. We staggered back, those of us who were left, and went to a rallying point. When I looked at the four companies reduced in strength, and thought of all the bright lads who had gone west, I cried like a child. Men of courage, I, Scotland's youth, daring, braving, beholding truth. Gordons, Seaforths, Cameron men, long shall we remember them. Scots Guards, Argyles were in our lot. Black Watch, Cameronian, Royal Scot, the RSF, and HLI stood as one man, to do or die. On the morning of the 9th, we all got a good mug of rum, so we knew what was coming off. At 6.15, we went over, along with the Gurkhas, and we took three lines of trenches. On the 10th, I got wounded. So I made tracks for the first aid, which was four miles away. I got my head dressed and was told to go to the clearing station. I hadn't had a decent sleep for six weeks, nor a wash, and it was 21 days since I last had a shave, so I must have been a pretty sight. We got inoculated in the stomach for trollop. I suffered great pain there. I was about mad for they first cut my hair and then shaved all round about the wound with two orderlies holding me down. I was glad when it was all over. That night we started for Passchendaele. What a place. Dead everywhere. No time to bury men here and no place to lie them either for miles around. Shell holes everywhere filled with water and mud. If you fall in, you're gone. swiftness and precision with which the programme should be carried out. High Command hoped to win positions within 48 hours of the opening on November 20th of the dramatic advance of the British infantry and tanks, a silent and impressive host, advancing mysteriously at dawn in the wake of our monster fleet of iron parts. been rolling over the land on the peaceful mission of gathering up millions of the people's money. Tanks save brave lives and cost about £5,000 each. The tank is here! It's your opportunity to assist your country by investing freely in war bonds and war savings certificates at the tank in George Square this week. The country expects Glasgow to set up a new record in tank investments. Flying Corps came into existence in May 1912. It was divided into a naval and a military wing. I believe that to ensure the efficiency of the air service in future, they ought to be combined. I am convinced a united, independent air service is a necessity. Words fail me to express the admiration which I feel for the splendid resistance offered by all ranks of our army. Many amongst us now are tired. To those, I would say that victory will belong to the side which holds out the longest. With our backs to the wall and believing in the justice of our cause, each one of us must fight on to the end. On the 9th of November, it was officially confirmed that the enemy had sent over ambassadors pleading for an armistice. During the night of the 10th and 11th, 
News came that fighting would cease that day, and what a great relief it was to all. By evening, the vigorous dancing of reels to the music of the pipes certainly cheered up the inhabitants of the village. The vast struggle that has dominated the hearts and minds of the greater part of mankind for four years and three months, and cut off in their flower some ten millions of the manhood of Europe, is still so near us that it is difficult to review even its main outlines in a satisfactory perspective. In this solemn moment of triumph, in this great hour which brings in a new era, let us here and now own how much we are indebted to the valiant men who fought and endured so that we should enter into this bright inheritance. We have had for nearly four years a great brotherhood of effort. We have had a brotherhood of sorrow and sacrifice. And now we have a brotherhood of joy. Let it not end here. Thank you.